Hello, and welcome to this APGO basic science objective video about maternal fetal physiology. After watching this video, you should be able to describe the maternal endocrine changes that provide an adaptive environment for the developing fetus, identify the physiologic changes of pregnancy that allow the mother to tolerate a symbiotic relationship, and explain how the physiologic adaptation of the fetus and placenta allow the fetus to thrive. Hey Jamie, how are you doing? Isn't your due date coming up soon? Ah, oh, I'm exhausted. This baby has taken over every single organ system in my body. <laughs> I don't think it's taken over every single organ system. Are you kidding me? Were you not listening to any of the ob lectures? The fetus is a master parasite! It's able to use its influence to manipulate every organ system and endocrine pathway. <laughs> okay, fine, but I bet I can find one organ system that is not manipulated. I know that ovarian hormones are affected, but it's not like the entire endocrine system is being manipulated. What about the pancreas or the tiny parathyroids? Nice try, Sam. Almost every endocrine hormone test is altered in pregnancy, some due to true physiologic changes and others due to increased liver production of binding globulins or decreased serum albumin due to the delusional effects of volume expansion. Maternal endocrine changes are also mediated by increased renal glomerular filtration, decreased hepatic clearance, or metabolic clearance of hormones by the placenta. There is not a gland that is spared. The pituitary gland increases in size mainly due to lactotroph hyperplasia, stimulated by high estrogen levels. Prolactin progressively increases during gestation in preparation for lactation, while FSH LH are almost undetectable. The thyroid gland enlarges in the first trimester. The HCG and TSH alpha subunits are very similar, thus elevated HCG has thyrotrophic effect. Total serum thyroxine increases due to increased production of thyroid binding globulin, however, free T3 and T4 remain unchanged. And those darling tiny parathyroid glands undergo hyperplasia to increase hormone production and meet the calcium needs of fetal bone formation. The pancreas? Yeah, that too. It undergoes hyperplasia of insulin-secreting beta cells. Insulin is responsible for intracellular transport of nutrients, but does not itself cross the placenta. Insulin regulates the availability of metabolites for placental transport. Even the adrenal cortex is not spared from fetal influence. The total serum cortisol is increased, mostly due to an estrogen-stimulated increase in cortisol-binding globulin, or CBG. Increased cortisol may also contribute to insulin resistance and development of striae. My least favorite, those darn stretch marks. Okay, Jamie, you win this time. Let's pause, think, and apply. When evaluating a pregnant patient, what happens if a physician fails to recognize normal pregnancy-related changes in endocrine function tests? This may lead to unnecessary testing and therapies that are potentially harmful to the fetus and the mother. Uh, my feet feel so swollen. This state of chronic volume overload with active sodium and water retention is getting old quick. <sighs> I guess the changes in the renin-angiotensin system and osmoregulation will come to an end soon enough. Jamie, what about the cardiovascular system? What? Yeah, the cardiovascular system is minimally affected by the fetus. Are you kidding me? My cardiovascular system is so tightly influenced by my fetus. First, my rib cage changes, and my elevative diaphragm has rotated my heart slightly. There's an eccentric hypertrophy of the heart resulting from expanded blood volume and increased afterload. The cardiac output increased in early gestation with a peak increase of 30 to 50%. This is a result of increased blood volume, heart rate, and stroke volume blood pressure and systemic vascular resistance decreased with mid-pregnancy nadir due to progesterone-mediated smooth muscle relaxation and relative unresponsiveness to angiotensin II and norepinephrine in pregnancy. There is also an increased risk of pulmonary edema due to the combined effects of falling systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance and decreased colloid osmotic pressure in pregnancy. Cardiac function crescendos in labor and immediately postpartum and must manage the autotransfusion that occurs after delivery of the baby and placenta as the uterus rapidly involutes. Okay, fine. I guess you're right. Aha! Sam, you scared me! What are you doing back there? The hematologic system. I win. Ugh, Sam, I can't believe how much you forgot from year one! The hematologic system is 100% influenced by the fetus. 
In fact, all components of blood, plasma, platelets, white blood cells, and red blood cells are altered in pregnancy. These changes are considered protective against possible hemorrhage. The total blood volume increases by 40 to 50% in pregnancy. One, there's an increase in plasma volume at six weeks with a mismatch in red cell volume that leads to a physiologic anemia natering at 28 to 34 weeks. Two, a threefold increase in erythropoietin causes erythroid hyperplasia in bone marrow to help increase red blood cell mass. Three, platelet counts decrease, partly due to hemodilution and partly due to an increased destruction and aggregability. Four, white blood cells, particularly neutrophils and granulocytes, increase due to elevated estrogen and cortisol levels in pregnancy. Finally, and most concerning, there is a five-fold increase risk for thromboembolism due to estrogen stimulation of the liver to produce procoagulants, and there is a decrease of natrocoagulation inhibitors and fibronolytic activity. So nice try, Sam, but you're gonna have to work harder to find something this baby is not trying to manipulate. Ah, uh, this is getting so hard now. Surprise from your spidey friend, pulmonary. There is no way that kiddo can get near your lungs. Are you kidding me? Do you hear me right now? My elevated diaphragm from the baby pushing up decreases my total lung capacity and functional residual capacity. Increased progesterone drives an increase in minute ventilation and chronic hyperventilation, resulting in an increased PaO2 and decreased PaCO2. Consequently, I have a chronic respiratory alkalosis that is partially compensated for by an increased renal excretion of bicarbonate. Although this mild dyspnea is compatible with daily activities, it does increase inspiratory muscle effort. So no, Sam, I still win. This baby is manipulating everything. Now, if you will excuse me, I have to find a bathroom. And before you even try, the renal system is definitely under siege. Progesterone causes smooth muscle relaxation, which dilates the ureters and renal pelvis as they empty more slowly. Renal plasma flow and glomerular filtration rate increase, leading to increased clearance of creatinine, glucose, urinary protein, and albumin. And my favorite is a decreased bladder capacity due to an enlarged uterus. Okay, on that note, Spidey will see you soon. Oh, and the bathroom is at the top of the stairs and on the left. Hey Sam, thanks for inviting me to join you for dinner. I am starving. Jamie, are you able to eat all of that at once? I just assumed with the increase in progesterone, you have a relaxed gastroesophageal sphincter and a wicked reflux, especially with the uterus causing gastric compression. Thanks, Sam. You are right sometimes. I do get reflux, but that's not even the half of it. Progesterone decreases intestinal motility and gastric emptying. Progesterone also slows gallbladder emptying, which leads to increased biliary cholesterol saturation and increased risk for gallstone production. But the worst is the increase in portovenous pressure that leads to terrible hemorrhoids. Well, at least I have a reduced risk for peptic ulcer disease. Thankfully, an increase in placental histamines leads to increased maternal gastric mucin production, which in turn protects my gastric mucosa. Immune changes also help increase tolerance of H. pylori. You're right, Jamie. The baby has influenced almost every body system. But remember, the baby has to make lots of adaptations to successfully live with you, too. The first and most important is dealing with your immune system. The fetus and the placenta produce estrogen, progesterone, human chorionic gonadotrophin, and human placental lactogen, which may allow for maternal tolerance of the antigenically different fetus. Progesterone also acts synergistically with relaxant to promote uterine quiescence and inhibits T-cell-mediated allograft rejection. This may aid in uterine tolerance of the trophoblastic tissue. The interference of maternal and fetal vasculature in the placental bed also blocks or masks antibodies and, as such, only IgG can cross the placenta. The benefit of allowing for passage of IgG is to provide passive immunity to the fetus and early neonate. This baby is certainly well protected and well fed, growing bigger and bigger every day. Well, I hope so. All that food and oxygen you're consuming is doing its job. Glucose, derived from the placenta, is the main substrate for fetal oxidative metabolism, especially in the fetal brain, to produce energy and tissue growth. Other substrates also include lactate and amino acids. 
Fat tissue growth is a result of conversion of carbohydrates to lipids and placental fatty acid uptake and uses about 20% of fetal oxygen consumption. Higher fetal insulin levels increase fetal body, heart, and liver weights. This is exacerbated in diabetic mothers with poorly controlled glucose levels. Corticosteroids, too, are important to fetal growth in organ maturation, with fetal levels increased at parturition. However, fetal growth actually slows near parturition, perhaps through suppression of fetal IGF-1. Binding proteins for IGF-1 increase near term, and high levels also correlate with uteroplacental insufficiency. Finally, let's not forget all those cardiovascular changes the fetus must undertake. You remember that APGO educational video number 8 that we saw during first year, right? Let's pause, think, and apply. Why does a fetus seemingly tolerate significant maternal hypoxemia as a result of maternal pneumonia or pulmonary edema? The fetus does not experience problems as readily because of compensatory mechanisms including increased cardiac output, increased FHR, increased oxygen carrying capacity of fetal hemoglobin, increased RBC, and anatomical shunts. Yeah, I remember that video. It is amazing how there's almost a total rerouting of the circulation with the first breath. And these compensatory mechanisms are able to maintain a state of fetal aerobic metabolism, even though I swear like I am constantly sucking wind these days. See, even though you feel like the baby is trying to manipulate all of your system for its benefit, the fetus has to make several adaptations to survive the intrauterine environment. Maybe it's more of a symbiotic relationship rather than a parasitic one, yeah? Okay, you're right. It is a pretty amazing system that allows a fetus to grow and develop. Thanks for reminding me. Sometimes it is easy to get caught up in all the discomfort. This concludes this APGO Basic Science Objective video about maternal fetal physiology. You should be able to describe the maternal endocrine changes that provide an adaptive environment for the developing fetus, identify the physiologic changes of pregnancy that allow the mother to tolerate a symbiotic relationship, and explain how the physiologic adaptation of the fetus and placenta allow the fetus to thrive. Thanks for watching.